That's right. Thanks very much. Uh, pleasure to be here again. So I have an admission to make first, and that is that I struggle greatly with climate change because most of our stakeholders, if you will, don't really, I mean, climate change is, um, is always on people's mind, but really it's weather more than climate that people are concerned about. So ruminants, so we deal with a variety of species. Uh, Dr. Bunn is gonna talk about his work with chickens, um, but a lot of what we do is with ruminants, and ruminants have a uh, problem, a, a, uh, a crisis in terms of the fact that they produce a lot of greenhouse gases, they utilize a lot of landscape for their, um, their maintenance. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think I have to tell any of you that animal agriculture is just absolutely essential to most of the smallholder farmers that we, um, that we deal with. And so there have been many recommendations about how we should eat less meat, raise fewer animals. I think most of this, in my mind, applies to the affluent countries like, uh, like the U.S. So there's really two sides to this coin about livestock. Yes, I mean, nobody can really deny that they are contributing in one way or another. The, the exact figures vary depending upon uh, agenda, but they contribute to climate change. But on the other hand, these livestock um, systems are threatened by climate change. So <laughs> one, of, one of my tasks is just to try to uh, figure out how climate change threatens livestock systems and how we can approach those kind of problems. So we've got a number of things in play here. Extreme weather, temperature, drought, flooding, all of those directly impact livestock production, morbidity and mortality. We've got, as a consequence of climate change, landscape degradation. <clears throat> We've got decreased forage availability and quality. There's been one example of a climate change research project, which we had nothing to do with, was basically looking at the effect of nutrient levels, variety of nutrients in forages raised at different temperatures. And so I think that's interesting. And then, of course, <clears throat> um, one of my personal favorites is increasing and changing patterns of livestock disease some of which is associated with climate change. So here are kind of the approaches that we've been taking, some of which are kind of serendipitous in terms of integrating climate change and livestock production systems. <clears throat> so it's clear that we need a better understanding of the near and far term effects of climate change on livestock systems. <clears throat> um, one way that we can mitigate the effects of the greenhouse gas production is to increase livestock productivity. Um, <laughs> we have some projects in place to, to mitigate the effects of climate change by promoting climate-ready animals, for example, um, or having those replace some of the species that are not quite as climate-ready. And then finally, a number of projects I'll mention briefly about mitigating climate-related diseases. So I'm in this uh, position of not actually getting to do any of the fun work myself. And so what I'm going to try to do is just give you a few examples of some of the projects that bear on this problem of livestock and climate change. So here in Nepal, we actually have two long-term research projects that are led by climatologists. <coughs> uh, near Krakauer is not here, but some of his representatives are here. And then Rob Gillies from um, Utah State University um, has been working in the, in, the western, whoop, in the western regions of Nepal. I blew that, didn't I? Um, for quite some time. So, so Rob is a, uh, is a bona fide climatologist, <laughs> and among the things that he's found that is really a bit scary is that the western region of Nepal seems to be undergoing this long-term, probably irreversible change in, in climate. And so that's manifest in a number of different situations in terms of the differences in precipitation over this 15 year period of time. This really is climate when he's talking, or it's getting at, clo at least close to climate. <laughs> he also has looked at um, a variety of measures of precipitation in western Nepal. And not to put words in Rob's mouth, and I'm certainly not a climatologist, but it looks like there are going to be some profound changes <laughs> in, um, in terms of drought in western Nepal which is very concerning for people that are raising livestock in that, in that area. Now, another one of our investigators is Nanda Joshi from Michigan State University. He's concentrating on livestock production efficiency. So as I work in a lot of different countries, I find that it's, it's really surprising how poor 
um, productivity is in a lot of these areas, and that's what Nanda is trying to address. Buffalo are very popular and important here in Nepal, <coughs> and so he's working on really especially two aspects of buffalo production <coughs> that, again, will ultimately, I think, assist in this increased productivity, which should mitigate some of the effects of climate change. One is on forage management, one is on reproductive management, and then he's got some work um, on disease control. So most of his work, um, or, or all of these projects, I should say, involve not only the field hardcore research, but a significant capacity um, building um, component. So this is, these are just some slides from, from several different projects. <coughs> these are from Nanda showing buffalo raising conditions and, and trying to increase productivity. This <coughs> is, um, all of our projects have a gender component. This is from NERS um, project um, training women in um, pilot, pilot um, projects. And then this is a, uh, another one of Nanda's projects on um, capacity building training farmers to, to enhance their reproductive uh, management, basically. So, <laughs> in terms of climate uh, resilience, um, <laughs> David Bunn is going to be talking, this is him right here, about chickens. And I'm a huge fan of chickens, um, but da I don't want to steal any of David's thunder. <laughs> um, I might say that that um, the agenda that I had from last week didn't have a, a climate change and livestock in Nepal in it. And so I've included some of the work that we do in Africa also. So this is a fellow, some of, many of you would probably know Lane Kopic. <laughs> so he has a project in Ethiopia and, and the system is, the, the situation is not at all unlike you see in, in a number of other places. There have been a number of droughts <laughs> resulting among other things in overgrazing. When landscapes are overgrazed, there tends to be an encroachment of um, bush, <laughs> and um, the grasslands recede. <laughs> when the grasslands recede, we don't have that water holding capacity, <laughs> and so any subsequent flooding leads to erosion and gully formation. And so, in essence, there's a big change to the landscape um, associated with a, an initial drought uh, period of drought. So this is one of those landscapes that's been kind of taken over and there's not a lot of grasses here available for livestock grazing. One of, um, one of uh, Lane's um, focus uh, uh, projects is basically to clear brush, okay? And he's found that if you clear brush, <laughs> the, the grasses will come back, these gully erosions will, um, can be mitigated and stay uneroded. So he's doing a variety of things uh, related to brush clearing. Callows are basically man-made islands, if you will, uh, for um, conserving um, grasslands. <laughs> and then gully remediation. Okay, now, climate-resistant livestock. You might recognize that this is not Nepal either. This is actually Fort Collins, Colorado. I just wanted you to know that there are camels in, in Fort Collins. This is one of my graduate students learning to not be afraid of big camels. Um, <laughs> this is actually a project on MERS coronavirus that has nothing to do with the CRISP, but um, a, a number of months ago, <coughs> we were um, tasked with, with uh, the concept of trying to promote resilience. And to my mind, camels are a resilient species that we can use to adapt certain livestock systems, particularly in Africa, to climate change. So they're, they're good at uh, dealing with these eroded landscapes like I discussed, they're, they're a climate ready kind of an animal. <coughs> so we have a number of projects, or a couple of different projects I should say, that are dealing with um, camels. Over the past five years in Ethiopia, there's been a change in the ratio of cattle to camels of like five to one to, um, to uh, or no, sorry, uh, like 13 to one to five to one, and so camels if you're not aware of it, are um, very popular. So um, Peter Lill is one of our investigators. He's a marketeer, basically, trying to understand marketing systems. And he's doing things like putting GPS locators on camels, trying to track their movements and relate that to markets. Um, Paul Plummer is a new person um, that is investigating um, camel diseases. So. Um, and then finally, climate-related diseases, and I thought I'd use this opportunity to introduce another uh, program that we have 
which is um, both in uh, Nepal and in East Africa, where we give small grants to postgraduate students. Okay, we call them scholars, basically. And the agenda here is to not only get some fundamental research done, but capacity building, trying to give these individuals a chance or, or a head start in competing in the international arena for funding over their time. So we've got about 18 of these, um, these young scientists that are working on a whole slew of different um, projects. But in terms of diseases, we have some of these scholars working on tick-borne disease, blue tongue, that's, also, that's a vector-borne disease. <coughs> vector-borne diseases are, of course, a, a poster child for climate um, related changes in disease incidence. Um, one of them is working on infectious abortion, swine parasites. You can see all of these different disease processes that these young scientists are working on. Um, and I personally think this has been uh, a real <coughs> highlight of our program. They're, they're so enthusiastic and produ productive. So we recently had an evaluation done, and one of the statements in that evaluation was that climate change is likely to be the biggest challenge facing livestock um, keepers globally living in these impoverished environments. I would take a little bit of issue with that. I mean, clearly I think climate change is important, but there's a whole slew of other things that are important. This is clearly a multifactorial problem um, of which climate change is one important aspect. So I think I'm about out of time. I'd be happy to answer any questions at the session in a, in a few minutes. To learn more, please visit agrilinks.org and feedthefuture.gov.